so I'm going to talk about um, my course at Stanford and in addition to some other topics, uh, disability and projects and things like that. Uh, this is, uh, yeah. So I'm in, uh, at Stanford in um, the mechanical engineering department, uh, the design group. I'm a lecturer there. I've been there for going on 12 years. So anybody have any initial questions? Okay. Um, so uh, please uh, don't use your smartphones or laptops. Normally, it's a thing I tell students because if they're on their laptop or cell phone, they may be physically in the room, but they're not mentally in the room. And so we want everybody's attention. So uh, a little bit about me. I um, got my undergraduate de degree in electrical engineering uh, at, from the University of Michigan. And that was me when I was about 21 years old. Yeah, look like a real hoodlum. And, and then I, uh, my master's degree in, in biomedical engineering from Northwestern. I worked at the VA Medical Hospital in, outside Chicago. And um, then I came over here in 79, worked at the, the VA's uh, Rehab Research and Development Center, which is now torn down. Uh, but this is what the, the medical center looks like now. And at Stanford, I have my, uh, my course in the winter, which starts in January. And I also help uh, out a bunch of other courses who, um, uh, have pr the, who the students do projects in assistive technology. Um, so I got inspired to do science type stuff by the, the TV program, Watch Mr. Wizard. Who remembers Watch Mr. Wizard? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was neat. Um, this is my home computer system in 1975-76. Uh, I recall a meeting we had of everybody in the Chicago area who had a home computer, and the 10 of us sat around one table, okay? So that, that was it. So um, here's me in action. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the role of uh, older adults and people with disabilities uh, in, in my, my course. Um, and um, um, the challenge is that uh, these projects um, uh, uh, address. So, so I'm going to talk about my course and talk about, in general, about assistive technology and disability. I talk about uh, uh, projects, the design process, um, problem statement. I'm going to do a little exercise at the end, not, not a physical exercise, so don't worry about that but a uh, paper, may be talking about interacting with um, engineers and commercialization of, of some of these products, okay? So the course objective, you know, the highest level is just to give students confidence in their engineering abilities um, because um, um, they're, gonna, they're, they're our future and they're gonna be out in, in um, in the real world, you know, working on problems like this, and it's good for them to have practice in how to do this. So the framework for that is the de design of technology that benefits people with disabilities and older adults, and that's called assistive <coughs> technology. Um, so here are some of the skills that I hope the students learn. Um, critical thinking, the ability to analyze things, to, to, to solve problems, to work in a team, working in the community, um, which is also called public service or service learning, going through this process, which I'll talk about later. And real, what's really important is having the ability to communicate both in presentations like I'm doing now and, and writing. They didn't tell me that was important when I went to engineering school. And I'm getting back at them because it's, it's really important. And, and you know, leadership uh, skills. So the course is about technology and people. It's about assistive technology. It's about the, the process of developing, um, developing um, uh, devices, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more, working in a team, being a partner in a local community. Um, and um, so it's really a preview of what the students are, hopefully will be experiencing in real life. You know, students are living in, a, in the matrix when they're at Stanford, okay? It's not the real world. So once they, they get out, they'll be in the real world. But at Stanford, they're, they're students, and that's not the real world. So the course is, meets uh, twice a week for 10 weeks, uh, starting in January. Um, and we talk about the design and use of 
assistive technology. Uh, we do that through uh, guest lectures uh, because I don't know everything about it and it's much better if you have somebody who has a background uh, or does things like a physical therapist or a researcher or a designer or, or other engineers to, to talk about we know what they're doing. We also have tours, we have a film screening and an assistive technology fair. Lots of opportunities for uh, discussion, thought and reflection and students can work on projects which gives them a design experience and, and to do that they go through the, these um, activities. Um, so I should say that uh, the, the video will be posted and the slides will be posted as well. So if you're taking copious notes and hoping to capture the slides, you may not have to do that because they'll be available. Okay. So these projects are, are about uh, building people. They're really not projects. You can uh, address things uh, from a, by looking at the problem or looking at the technology. So you can have the, the sometimes a, technolo a new technology will solve an existing problem, but other times um, you might identify the problem first and then search for technology that would help. Uh, these are typically eight week prototypes, so it's not a long time to, to get something built and working. So they're not quite ready for market yet. Um, and so students can work on low-tech uh, solutions or high-tech ones that involve electronics or electromechanical systems. And we look at solutions that, that benefit one person because um, there's lots of people with disability, but everyone is a little bit different, have different needs and desires. Um, so um, rather than go out and, and um, thinking about every person with a disability, it's good to address the needs of one person, especially with that person that is somebody local that the students can work with. And that's sort of a requirement of, of these projects that they work with somebody local so they can get a better understanding of the, of the problem and also can test their prototypes. Okay, so the, the project priorities is going through this design process um, and then testing, building and testing something that works so it's, it's functional. But again, it may not be ready for commercial use because typically a commercial product goes through maybe dozens and dozens of iterations before it's ready to go. So I tell the students that their, their team, which is a, three members, is like a startup where you have the team, you have resources, there's deadlines, then there's a budget, there's people to report to, there's a problem, there are customers, and there's a goal. So sometimes that will motivate a student says, I'm working on a startup project, you know. Um, so here's some of the lectures I, I have in my course, and there's a lot of other people involved. Um, you know, there's uh, people from out of town, local people. Uh, this is a, a film that I show at the end. Uh, there's a, a fellow that's um, into prosthetics. Um, of older adults, we have students with disability. Uh, we have uh, physicians. We have people that work at the VA. Uh, former student and colleague now. Uh, so lots of lots of interesting people. Uh, here's a the lecture titles from this past year is to give you an idea of what we talk about in the course. So I do a little bit of an overview in a second class session. Um, people uh, approve uh, people pitch approved projects to the class and students form teams and select projects. Uh, we have a, a talk about need finding. Uh, we have a talk by an occupational therapist. Uh, who introduces us to um, people who have had stroke and some uh, low-tech devices that help those folks. The best, the best uh, session is one where I bring in Stanford students who have disabilities and they talk about their disability and the technology that they use uh, to make them successful students. And because it's the peer group to the students, um, they pay very close attention. I mean, they're almost mesmerized. Um, talk about prosthetics, exoskeletons. Our first, first tour last year was um, to the Magical Bridge Playground. Who knows about the Magical Bridge Playground? Have you been there? Yeah. So I just heard like they have projects planned for Sunnyvale, Redwood City, and Morgan Hill. So there's going to be those are going to be replicated. So um, we we go over there and have the students check out the accessibility of all the equipment but typically they just turn into kids playing on, on the swings and stuff. Okay, 
uh, have a colleague come in from uh, um, um, the Reno area to talk about uh, sports equipment and other things. We go to the VA Medical Center. Uh, we, um, we talk to veterans. Um, uh, we had, I had the special guest lecturer who talked about the eyewear that he uses to perceive the world in a, in a little bit different way. Um, we had a, a woman talk about co-design, that is having the users design with, this, with students. Um, uh, we t actually talk about aesthetics. I bring in some, then I bring in some people from the local community who have services or products to show off. So that's a, like an outdoor event, it's sort of like uh, the big abilities expo in, in San Jose, but it's maybe a dozen vendors. We go to a lab that looks at uh, walking in kids with cerebral palsy. Um, yeah, well, it looks like I have aesthetics here twice. We have a film screening and then I bring in a, um, a colleague who uh, talks about um, his, his activities in wheelchairs in developing countries. So all sorts of neat stuff. So this is how I torture my students. Uh, that's, Anne on the left here is in obvious pain as she slides down a, a hill at the Magical Bridge Playground. And then I challenged this team last year to uh, stand on this rotating uh, disc at the Magical Bridge Playground. So, uh, the, but the, the, they, they actually enjoy all the stuff. So, any questions about the course so far? Yes? Um, what constitutes a student versus somebody who's sort of auditing or joining? Uh, I'll talk about that later. Okay. okay. Yes, it's an engineering course. Um, I'm physically located in, in the mechanical engineering uh, department, but the course is open to anybody throughout the entire university. Any student can enroll in it. Doesn't matter what year they're in or what their discipline is. Um, and I talk, I'll talk about the ways uh, that students can enroll um, and how you could be a part of, the, part of this. It, but it's basically a non-technical course there's no quizzes or exams and students like that. <laughs> and uh, because, you know, once you get out of Stanford, you know, you don't take quizzes or do exams. So it's, it's unfortunately studying is a skill that students never use after they get out of, after they graduate. So, you know, why promote that? So I'm going to talk about disability and assistive technology here. Um, so disability is typically thought of as, as some kind of limitation uh, that a person has in their activities. And activities are, are the things we do uh, in everyday life, you know, uh, being mobile, getting around, doing housework, taking care of ourselves, uh, things like that. Uh, the World Health Organization has a really good um, definition that it in, is in three parts. It starts with an impairment, so that's a problem in your body or your mind and its structure or function, which causes an activity limitation, that, that is you can't do uh, certain things, um, and that, that in turn causes a restriction in participation in some um, um, activity that involves other people or involves society, okay? Uh, so it's not just a health thing, and it's not just a personal thing, but it also um, involves features of, the, of society, like environmental, that is, um, that like stairs could be a barrier for uh, a wheelchair user or social barriers that people may be, people with disabilities may be excluded from certain activities because of their disability, okay? The Americans with Disability Act, Act defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that limits one or more major life activities. So that's pretty much the gist of things. But a more inclusive definition that, that I came up with is any situation that prevents an individual from taking full advantage of their talents and, and opportunities, um, including s circumstances such as like war. So if you're, if you're in a country that's ravaged by war, it's going to be hard for you to, um, to show off your talents in playing a piano, for example. It may not, may not work, okay? So you just don't have the opportunity to show off your skills in, in an environment like that. 
So a lot of famous people with disabilities here. Um, and here's a few more I've added uh, recently. We got uh, Nemo and Dory. Uh, we got Tiny Tim. And we got this uh, warrior from, uh, um, from the movie Rogue, um, um, who was uh, actually pretty good at using his weapon. And then all the male actors all the, on Big Bang Theory have disabilities. And I go through this in my, in my, in my talk to the students. So we all know about, about Sheldon and uh, some of the other folks. Uh, but Penny's disability is that she has no last name. And so, it's, so unless you're Cher or Beyonce or somebody, it's hard to get around life without a last name. But, but it, maybe a better way to look at it is look at, at, at ability and how your ability changes during life. You know, when you're, when you're born, you're typically pretty helpless. You can't do anything on your own. Um, and then you're able to, to, to sit up and start walking and balance is a big issue. <coughs> Riding a two-wheel bike <coughs> was really important for me. Going from printing to uh, writing was a, a, big, a big step educationally. And of course, you know, drive, being able to drive your car and moving out of the house and stuff are all big things in your life. But you know, so you, you know, I'm not sure the exact curve of, of this, but um, you know, later in life you lose some of these abilities and it becomes harder to, to do, do things. But um, um, I think we all uh, you know, go through these life events the same. So let's talk about assistive technology. So assistive technology is not just devices, but it's also the process that makes these devices available to people. A uh, device has, can have a, some, a benefit that would include a diagnostic benefit, a functional benefit, a rehab benefit um, as well. So it makes you or your caregiver's life easier, okay? And engineers uh, use a process to, to bring these products to, to market. Oh, hi, Amy. Um, so here's an example of one, um, of one product, and this is actually made in, up in San Carlos, this wheel wheelchair. And so it was actually designed the number one goal was to make it look really pretty, aesthetics. Aesthetics was its number one goal. And so it looks different and neat. And so maybe if the wheelchair looks cool, then the user will look cool too, right? Because you don't want to be seen in a wheelchair that looks ugly or a car that looks, looks ugly or in clothes that look ugly. So it reflects on the person's um, assistive technology reflects on them. So it's really important to design things that have an aesthetic appeal. And um, the front wheels here are um, called Omni wheels, and we did it a, and here's what they look like um, when they're all put together. And we did a design for an omnidirectional wheelchair when I was working at the VA, and this was a three-wheel device that unfortunately never made it to market. So, so in the world of assistive technology, I was thinking about this, and I say, you know, we use assistive technology every day. I mean. I mean, how many people would be lost without their cell phone, without their electricity or air conditioning or mobility, cars, airplanes, and stuff like that, uh, cameras, um, their projector, and even places like facilities like this. So when you take a look at you know, what a human you know, has, we need to have all these things around us to make it to, to live the way we want to live, right? And so everything around us is assistive technology. I mean, contact lenses, it just goes on and on. So it might be interesting to think about things like that. And the biggest piece of assistive technology is Stanford University, because without facilities like Stanford, you know, we would have, we would have no knowledge and we wouldn't be able to help each other um, make life better for all of us. So Stanford technology, assistive, assistive technology. So let's, uh, I'm going to show you some images of pro projects from uh, last year. Um, oh, this is what actually one that uh, Amy suggested. So this is a, a pill that vibrates to the music so that dancers who don't have the ability to stand for a long time uh, may enjoy the music um, in, in, a, in an additional way. So it vibrates to the beat of the music. And this is the... <laughs> This is uh, the student's uh, uh, electronic design, and this was his, his like, first 
attempt at designing stuff. So it had two microcontrollers in it and lots of wires and spaghetti all over the place. But uh, um, it, it turned out pretty good. This was a really good project. Uh, there was a woman who has difficulty uh, grabbing things. And she, it was particularly frustrating for her to, to deal with power cords and USB cables and um, a cord for recharging her wheelchair. She just didn't have the ability to, to grab things. So the students just cut a piece of um, um, plastic and uh, tie wrapped the cord to it. And because it's larger like this, she was able to handle it a lot easier. And so it was for 75 cents, you know, this was a, was a, a really great solution for, for, for Maui. Uh, this was a magical bridge playground project. And since, uh, so they made a, a scale model of something that could be in the, in the playground. So these are animals that have been, um, have a sensor on the back. So when, well, first of all, they're tactile. So, I mean, you, so if you have a, a person who, a kid with a visual impairment, they can touch it and realize, you know, what kind of an animal it is. But if they touch it in the right place, it plays uh, sounds. It plays the sound that the animal would make, okay, you know, roaring or whatever. But it could also be descriptive. It could also, you know, talk about, I am a lion, I live in Africa, and things like that. Okay, here comes June. Hi, June. <laughs> okay, uh, this team worked on a uh, pressure switch for a... Um, um, a prosthetic, um, um, the, the socket for a prosthetic leg. Uh, the idea is that the the stump varies in volume during the day, and so you want to main you want to maintain a certain amount of pressure against the, the uh, socket during the day. And in order to do that, you have to add or take off socks, as the case may be. So this was a a pressure switch that uh, that sensed that and hooked up to. <clears throat> An Arduino, which, um, which would broadcast the need to add or, or take off a sock to the person's cell phone. Okay. Ah, this is a project, another Magical Bridge Playground project, where they built, instead of building a climbing wall, they built a climbing incline. And the students actually built these handholds out of really soft plastic, um, different colors that, that, li that light up. Um, so it was an interesting uh, project, uh, but this is a, like a full-size one. So the idea here is that maybe you can climb up a, a small incline instead of being on a, on a wall. So it uh, wouldn't be as harmful if you fell off. Um, this was a project for um, Abilities United. So they're on Middlefield and, and Charleston, actually pretty near the Magical Bridge Playground. So they have clients that have developmental disabilities from kids to older adults. And one of the problems that we um, identified was that a lot of the clients uh, don't have enough control of their arm to, to do their artwork independently. Um, and, it, and so they, the team came up with a, an easel that has a handhold. This is the handhold here. And this is a pen that that sort of restricts the motion near the artwork. And it could be uh, um, you know, a canvas or it could be some, a coloring book type of thing. So they um, you know, laser cut this and uh, made all these materials. And so a person holds on to that. And just by moving uh, the, the arm around, they can, they can partic participate in drawing on their own without having a staff person help them. Okay. Uh, this is a design for um, Max, um, whose lower body is shown here. And he has a, 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 a leg that was damaged in a car accident. Um, so he, he lost a lot of strength in his muscle that extends his knee. So um, a few years ago, students worked on this device, which actually has a cord, a bungee cord going around, um, around it to aid in extending his leg. And so these students actually uh, improved on that a little bit by taking one of these hand exercisers. There's a device inside of it called a torsion spring. And they added that on, on his uh, leg brace as well to give him even more um, ability to, to extend his leg. 
And this guy is like an extreme athlete, and he does you know weight lifts and stuff like that. Just an amazing guy, um, and so um, uh, this worked out pretty well too. And this is a project that uh, June uh, suggested last year. These students built a, a mechanism inside walking sticks that make it um, possible for June to pick up um, small articles and, and papers from, from the ground. Um, so um, unfortunately, the, the device didn't survive very, very long, but the concept was there and it was executed pretty well. Okay. This is a project from last year. Um, uh, again, we, we, it was a walking stick project, and we redid um, Barbara's walking sticks for her uh, last year. Um, and um, so that worked out pretty good, too. Um, in another course, we uh, uh, did a project, students did a project for Magical Bridge Playground, and they imagined a, a geodesic dome that would be twice as big as this or the children would be half as small that the children can play in. And they had a device here that you could speak into and there was a tube going on to the other side so you can speak it in on one end and hear it at the other end and there was all sorts of tactile things that went on the side as, as well. So um, yeah, that was neat. This is another team's effort to build a low cost um, artificial, uh, uh, low cost ankle for people who uh, use um, uh, prosthetic feet um, and, and legs. Um, so if you have an artificial leg, it may not have a pivot at, at the ankle, okay? So if you're gonna do something, and so not having a pivot at the ankle makes it really hard to walk up or down hills and impossible for the user to wear high heels. <laughs> so you need an ankle for that, okay? <coughs> so the students came up with a 3D printed model here that would be perfect for uh, a low cost um, artificial leg in developing countries. Uh, Claire worked on this um, scoliosis um, um, device for a child of an admin at, uh, at Stanford. And uh, so normally these things are attached by Velcro. And you know when you rip a Velcro, lots of noise. And she had to readjust her brace in the middle of the night. And every time she did that, it would wake up the whole family. So Claire found silent Velcro. <laughs> it's really neat stuff. All you got to do is, is pull it an eighth of an inch and, and it lifts right off. Perfect. So, um, you know, very simple solution uh, to a to a um, possibly big problem. So I'm going to talk about you know where these student projects come from. You know, I solicit them from the community. That's one of my purposes in being here today. I also have newsletters that I send out to to people that um, um, asking them to submit project ideas. Sometimes I suggest projects. Sometimes a student with a disability comes in and uh, defines, suggests a project to help him or her. Um, so these are all, all uh, sometimes the projects are student defined for a family member or a friend or something like that. So those are all ways I get project ideas. So in summarizing the course activities, it's a very flexible course focused on, on confidence and enhancing professional skills through lecture projects, field trips, screenings, midterm and final presentations and reports, and project demonstrations. So te assistive technology benefits everyone and everything around us is assistive technology. Okay. Any questions about this part? Okay. Okay, you have a question. Um, one, one total in, in 11 years. That's not the point. The point is having students go through this process and working with people in the, the community. But any product requires a lot more work and time than just a student effort. Okay, so it's, it's never going to happen. And in assistive 
technology devices are particularly hard to commercialize because um, there are relatively few people with disabilities who might use a specific product. Yes. I want to follow that up. So how many of the prototypes are still used by the people? That uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Most, a lot of the times, they're not even useful enough for a person to use because they may break. It's a prototype. Um, so um, in some cases, I, I say, you know, this is too crude of a project, a product, or a device. You know, don't, don't use it. So, but again, that's not the point. The point of the, cor the course is for the students to learn about how to solve problems. And it just so happens I use the area of assistive technology to do that. Yes? But do some of these projects get bought by big companies as soon as I would, I would only hope that they would do that. But uh, there was one project that uh, students worked on that was stolen by a company. <laughs> so we, the students had this really nice device to put on uh, stockings. And the next thing I, I know, I saw it in their catalog. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not worth going through that. Excuse me? Yeah, it got, it got deployed. Do you, Bill, did you have a question? Yeah, um, you described guest lectures. What about um, mentors to help individual project teams? Do they have okay. some resources other than yourself? Right. When they're stuck, they need help. Okay. So the, the, way the, the way that it works with uh, projects is that the person who suggested a project, the project who may be an end user or may be um, a caregiver or some other person, is works with the, with, uh, the team um, to uh, help them along with the project. Um, I have uh, three or four uh, sort of resident um, people, uh, coaches with backgrounds in um, uh, occupational therapy and mechanical engineering um, aesthetic and, and aesthetics to help out. But uh, typically I don't like using random people from the community to mentor students because uh, the students have to do things them, themselves and it takes a little practice to know how to best mentor or coach a student because the mentors typically want to say, well, here's the way you should do it and I don't want that, okay? Yeah. Right. Well, that's one of the goal of um, assistive technology is to promote um, independence and improve the quality of life. Those are the two, two main things. So anything that um, can impact those things in a positive way are, are ripe for working on. What about things that make it easier to assist people? Oh, yeah, that's a part of it, too. So anything I talked about this earlier, I talked about uh, uh, an assistive technology device that could be, could be something diagnostic that helps it helps a physician. It could be um, uh, a therapeutic that provides therapy. Um, it could, if it's something that makes it easier for the caregiver, that's assistive technology too. You know what else is assistive technology? Service dogs. Service dogs are assistive technology. They happen to be a technology that's alive, but <laughs> nonetheless, it's assistive technology. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. There's there's a lot of resources at, at Stanford uh, that uh, can help um, a student team would, to become entrepreneurs and get them money to move things forward to start a company and things like that. Um, No, there's there's whole there's whole groups of people that that help. There's a there's a uh, a place called uh, at Stanford called StarX and Bases that um, that will help help students. There's also the Office of Technology Licensing that will help um, uh, get a patent uh, uh, for a device. Uh, Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. 
So it would, be, it would be good to get these things out to market and make it, make it public. And so there are, a num um, there are a number of places on the internet where students can post their projects to, to put them in basically in the public domain so that other people can reproduce that, okay? Uh, but it's up to the student to do that. It's not, not a part of the course. And, uh, but, you know, I've been looking at this technology for over 30 years, and every day I get like two or three articles that talk about some new piece of technology or device and stuff like that. I hear about it once and then it disappears. So there's a lot of fall off in, in you know, getting these things out to market. So it's a, it's a, real, it's a real problem because you know, products want to have a lot of users because so they can manufacture a huge number of them. Anything over 50,000, you can take advantage of mass production techniques to lower the cost and stuff like that. But for the disability market, you know, basically every person is, needs a custom device. So how do you do that? There's a real mismatch there. You, you can do things like <coughs> universal design, which means designing things to be inclusive so everybody can use it. But you can only go so far. You can't have a one wheelchair that fits everybody, for example. Um, and everybody requires a little bit different way of doing things. So it's really, really tough. And that's why these devices are expensive and the companies are small. Because there's not a homogeneous market. And people don't realize that. Anyway, let me go on to the design process. So I'm going to talk about a, a plan of action that for for people who do this kind of, of things to achieve a goal. And you want to do this in a structured way because it increases the chances of success. So the people who may be involved are, are people that are called makers or do-it-yourselfers, and they have a process called makeathons and hackathons where they get together for an extended 24 hours to three days to whatever and just to live, eat, and sleep, um, you know, making things. And here's, here's a picture from, from one that was a couple years ago that Google X um, helped out with. And here's one in the building uh, where my office is. Um, so people who are not engineers have a design thinking process, which I'll go through. And engineers have their own process. Why these different processes? Because these people, uh, all these different categories of people have different levels of knowledge in this area. So this is the design thinking process. How many people have ever heard of design thinking? Okay, all right. So this is what they teach at the, the D school at Stanford. Um, but they, they go through all these different uh, aspects. So, uh, but it, it's mainly for non-engineers. Um, and certainly non-engineers could be very creative and come up with solutions as well. Um, uh, but engineers have some additional talents and knowledge to bring to bear on the problem. Um, so here's a little bit of a description of what each one of these things are. I want to focus on what they talk about user needs here. So in, in my mind, a need is a, a judgment. You judge what is needed, okay? But how do you make a good judgment of that, of what's needed? Well, you need to have a good of an understanding as you can. I mean, you can see somebody with a disability from a distance and I can, I can say, well, that person, needs so-and-so device, but how do you really you know, know that? Um, so you need to, to gather as much information as you can, um, and maybe you say, okay, I'm gonna build a device for that person. What is the, the hazard in doing that? Well, the hazard is that something may already exist, and unless you go and look for it, you're gonna be spending a lot of effort, time, and money on recreating something that's already available. And I've seen this over and over and over again that people have in their mind, I'm going to help people with disability. I'm going to focus on this group, maybe locally, maybe in Ru Rwanda, and I'm going to build something and, and help them and save the world. Mm -hmm. But in, in most every case, there's stuff that's already available that could solve that problem. Okay. Okay, so that, that's really important. That's a, a, mess, a message. So the, the process, all these processes involve some cycle where you build something and test it and analyze it and then say, okay, I can improve this and that and whatever. 
And those things sometimes are called failures, but if you learn from them, it's not a failure, it's a part of the process. So a lot of students get in their mind that to get from, from here to the solution is a straight line. And if they just keep on working on it and working on it, they'll, they'll get there. But what you really need to do is to try something really simple and easy and see if you're on the right track. Sometimes when people do this, they, the students do this, they get halfway and they say, you know, I've learned enough to know that this is never going to work, so I'm going to start over. Maybe it involves redefining the problem. And uh, so, but all that effort is, something, is required. You need to go through this process and have these failures to have the knowledge to get to the solution. So it's not a failure, not failures. So here's, here's the process from my point of view. There's a lot of things relating to the problem. There's uh, thinking of uh, ideas. There's selecting one, of, uh, one or more of those ideas to prototype and to, uh, to test and then communicate um, to other, other folks. So let's go through them. So the problem is really the crux of the issue. So if you're going to go through this process, you have to search for a problem. You have to go out in the community and you have to define an area and uh, search for the problem. And then, so you're gonna be talking to people and, and getting an idea of, of what's, what the issues are. Then you're gonna identify a problem. And say, aha, that, you know, that's, that, that could be, that's a problem that I may wanna, may wanna um, to work on. And it's really important from my point of view to actually describe the problem. And I'm gonna talk about um, how to do this. And then, you know, when I was talking about understanding the problem, going online, talking to other other experts in the field because if you're going to do something that's like a piece of physical therapy product for example it makes perfect sense to talk to people who are physical therapists right but a lot of people don't don't do that and then once you have all that then you can say i know i have this knowledge a full understanding i know what's needed and i can i can move on to the next step so search for the problem pick a field there's observational techniques, interview techniques that you can employ to, um, to search for the problem. Identify a specific challenge. Identify all the, the people who may be involved um, in that. And identify resources and technology that may, may be brought to bear on the problem. So in the problem statement, I like to have a written problem statement. And here's the elements that include. And I'll go through these one at a time because it's really important. A project title, it may not be the first thing you come up with, but it's good to have a short title uh, for the project so you can, you can um, talk to other people about it. So we call this project the Enhanced Visibility Project for reasons that will become, um, be, become apparent. So the background is uh, just a little bit of information about, uh, about, about the problem. So in this case, it's this, this mobility device is meant to give wheelchair users a sleek alternative to standard products which lack aesthetic appeal and thereby reinforce stereotypes of weakness or helplessness. Okay, so that's a good background, okay? Perfectly neutral, it's, it, it, it's very descriptive. The problem, again, has to be very concise, clear, concise. It doesn't have to go into a lot of detail, typically one or two sentences. So in this case, the wheel, wheelchair has, has built in, a built-in light, um, but they do not provide adequate visibility to, to see and be seen at night. That's the crux of the problem. So it's what is the problem, not how to solve it. Okay. Uh, then the goal or the aim is what are you trying to achieve? And this is really important for, you need to be honest. Are you just doing it as a mental exercise or are you doing it as a, making a physical model of something uh, uh, or a functional prototype or a student project or you're really going to be doing a commercial product? You really need to know what you're trying to achieve. And why do you want to do it? You know, a lot of these makeathons don't usually, or hackathons don't really have a really good result, but they create a lot of interest and maybe that's the point, you know, to create interest in an area. Um, the, the, the one that Google did, you know, was a lot about publicity and the way I, why do I want to do it? Because it's, it's part of the course, okay? But it's not how to address the problem. So the, the goal and aim typically begins with explore designs that will enhance the nighttime visibility of the wheelchair and thereby increase 
user safety. Perfect, right? One sentence describes the goal. And then the design criteria, it, it, it defines what, your, what the device should do and how it must perform in general terms. And you want to sort of prioritize things and things that are required, things that you know, should be included, and things that would be you know, uh, really nice to include. So here, in, this, in this case, here's the example. Will not permanently deface or damage the wheelchair, integrate it into, into its appearance, provide the illumination, enhance uh, side and and side and forward visibility uh, operate automatically include a manual override and for the students I put in include a light show mode because students <laughs> like to work on on stuff like that okay and then uh, another part is is other information you want to have a link to the to the manufacturer's site uh, you want to have links to articles um, things like that uh, you want to have a list of people to contact, you know, maybe the manufacturer, maybe there's users, maybe there's healthcare professionals. Um, so you want to have, get a collaboration going with all these people who, are, who may be involved. So this is what it all turns out to be, you know, sort of condensed. And this is what I give the students. This is, this is what they get as a starting point for, for their project. I identify the project. There's other classes that if they have enough time, they can have the students go out and spend two or three weeks identifying a project and, and you know, before they even start working on it. But in a short class like mine, it's best to have the projects identified beforehand. So let's see how, how good the students did. So this is the, the device, the Omni wheel and stuff on it. Uh, so let's see what the students have done. This is the before picture and this is the after picture. So they put all this LED lighting on the front on both sides and side lighting that is a variety of colors on, on, on the side and an absolutely fantastic job. And there's a microcontroller that controls all, all this. Um, so, uh, you know, this was a huge success uh, for the students to do this. Okay. So now we come to the exercise. So I've gone through this design process, but uh, I'd like you to be, to assume the role of a person with a disability or an older adult and create this problem statement. Um, and maybe I'll go through the last few slides, uh, then I'll have you um, um, fill this out uh, on your own and, and maybe during you can have some questions and answers. So think about how um, a problem or, uh, and think about if, you, if it was an approved project, how you would pitch it to the class in three minutes. So do that in your head and there's a written component. Well, let me get through these last couple slides first and then I can give you, uh, pass these out. So the requirements of these is that it has to be a new creative solution, not something that's a copy. Unfortunately, you won't have the ability to use your laptop to see if there's something else on the market that's available to solve the problem. So for the students, it's gotta be physically small because you don't have a lot of room to work on things. I don't, I can't have students work on things that will actually provide therapy or surgery or stuff like, like that. Or don't, we don't work on pharmaceuticals, okay? We don't, uh, there, there's, there's no projects that will increase, you know, your healthcare benefits, stuff like that. That's, uh, you know, no, no legal, legal things or policy changes. It's a, like, wouldn't it be good if, if every crosswalk, you know, had added you know, another five seconds on it so we can get, a, get across the, uh, the street without problem. No home modifications or infrastructure stuff. So those are some of the requirements of this. And if a project gets a, um, approved, then um, people with disabilities or um, older adults have the, will interact with the, with the students and uh, so the first thing they're, they're, they're going to know, have to know, is have to understand the problem. So they're going to have to observe the problem, ask you questions about it. Uh, the, the, the users would tell a story, describe, you know, what the device should do, but, you know, not how, you know, what technology to employ. Because even people with disabilities or older adults don't have a full grasp of what technology is avail available and what isn't available, what would work and what may not work. So that's up to the students to do. So you want to list design features and you want to have at least one element that involves aesthetics or, or what I call it the coolness factor because you want it to look, look cool. 
Okay, and uh, and uh, a user would have to inter interact with the project team throughout the project to test prototypes and suggest uh, solutions. So I want to talk more about commercialization. There are, is assistance to get things, um, to move things forward toward commercialization. There's venture capital available. There's all sorts of design competitions where you can get, students get, can get money from. But to start a company requires a lot of things. You have to, you know, hire people, find the space, you know, uh, manufacture the product. So you need some, some, some tools or equipment to do that. And it's important to note that the retail price of something is typically like 10 times the cost of the parts. Even an iPhone, an iPhone, take a look at the parts and multiply that by three, and that's the, the list price of an iPhone. And they, the only way they, they can actually achieve that is because they have this, this labor force that works really cheaply, and it's all highly automated as well. So, so manufacturing a, a product is another iterative process that may require years and years and mil millions of dollars. So even something fairly simple, you know, I tell the students, how do you want to spend your next three years and how, how are you going to raise $3 million? And so that's, and then you have to worry about things like product liability insurance and all, all those things. So success is always uncertain in this field. So assistive technology, the devices, the, the market for those devices are, is highly fragmented because even though there's 75 million people in the U.S., um, um, the, the market for any individual device is fragmented down to the individual. So there's not one market of 75 million. There are 75 million individual markets almost, okay? It's, that's why things are, are tough. Um, I tell students not to get stuck in one part of the process. I had a student who just loved to brainstorm, and she would do that on every occasion, but couldn't get past that. And it's not a failure if you learn something. So the summary is, you know, it's all about the problem. Very few things make it to market. I'm inviting you to sit in on my course starting in January. I have a sign-up, yet another sign-up sheet for that. If you don't get my newsletter already, this is how you get the newsletter, which has um, announcements about coming lectures and, and local events uh, like, like this. Okay, so that, that'll be over here. So um, a key issue for, for engineers is to start prototyping quickly with low-cost solutions. Um, you want to start fail early and learn from all your failures anticipate your successes and failures. You want to employ users and caregivers and all the people that are involved in a product from the very beginning because if you build something for an imaginary person, you're going to come up with an imaginary solution. I've seen this again, time and time again. This is, you know, a, a student might be build, some, build something but never talk to anybody. And where does it go? Nowhere, okay? <laughs> 